Nobody really knows what happens after you die. We all speculate, we all wonder and worry, we all put our chips into different theories and cross our fingers. Eternal salvation, a great kingdom, a lush garden, the cosmic infinite, ceaseless punishment, endless void, nothing. Just thinking about it can be scary and exhilarating and peaceful at the same time, and these conflicting emotions can motivate us to act wildly in regards to death. Some try to hold it off as long as possible, while others prematurely rush headlong into it. Nobody really knows what happens after you die, but everybody dies. It's the one certainty we have, and that certainty is the driving force behind everything that happens in Sabriel. Sabriel is a 1995 fantasy novel written by Australian author Garth Nix, and is the first book in Nix's Old Kingdom series, consisting of four novels and a few short stories, with a fifth novel coming out this October. Our protagonist, the titular Sabriel, lives on the border between two worlds, in more ways than one. Geographically speaking, to the south is Anselstier, a land of science and progress that's technologically similar to early 20th century Earth, with electric lights, automobiles, and telephones. In stark contrast to that, across the wall to the north lies the Old Kingdom a mysterious land of wild magics where necromancers play games and the undead run wild. Sabriel is a child of the Old Kingdom, but was brought over to Ancestlier by her father, Abhorzen, to attend a boarding school. Near the end of her time there, the now 18-year-old Sabriel is approached by one of her father's messengers, learning that Abhorzen, a kind of necromancer himself, is trapped within the realm between life and death and that the magical protections he's placed on the walls separating the two lands will fail with the next full moon. Given her father's sword and a series of magical bells, Sabriel sets out to her ancestral home to find out what's happened, picking up companions along the way, such as Mogget, a magical construct that takes the form of a cat, and Touchstone, a mysterious boy who's trapped in the form of a wooden statue for 200 years. Together, they discover the evil plans of a great undead known as Karagor, who seeks to rise in the land of the living and unleash wild magics. If I was to sum up the writing in Sabriel in one phrase, it would probably be Path of Least Resistance. By this, I mean Garth Nix opts for very easy plotting and characterization. The book's structure is designed so as to move with a minimal amount of work. For example, let's take our main character, Sabriel, and her dual citizenship. She was born in the Old Kingdom and taught the ways of necromantic magic by her father, but spent her formative years outside of the Old Kingdom, so she doesn't know its geography and culture. What does this accomplish? A, we're given a protagonist who is versed in the rules of the setting, so that we don't waste page space on her learning these rules, as well as allowing her to be a competent badass right off the bat, but B, she's still enough of a fish out of water character to act as an audience surrogate, allowing for discovery and exposition. She is a character designed to streamline the story, to fulfill as many functions as possible with as little conflict as possible. I'm going to get into this in more detail in a moment, but first let's ponder a question. Is writing an easy story a bad thing? Is simplicity of story a sin or a virtue? As with all art, there's no definitive answer to that. It almost certainly depends on the motivation of the artist. Sometimes you'll have a writer creating simple stories out of laziness, using tropes and shorthand and Joseph Campbell because those things are popular and are known to sell. But sometimes you'll get a writer who opts for a simple story so that it doesn't get in the way of complex theming. And I think Garth Nix fits into the latter more than he does the former. He's not a pulp author, though young adult fantasy is very much a pulp field. Sabriel the book is interested in death, our reaction and relationship to death, and how death relates to the ideas of destiny. 
Every single thing that happens in this book is in some way related to death. Sabriel tries to save her father from death. Touchstone is trying to come to terms with death. Karagor is trying to conquer death. With the exception of a few bow-happy bandits near the end of the book, every enemy faced is some kind of undead creature, from basic zombies to the Mordicant, a demonic being of fire and darkness. Necromancy is one of the most prominent and dominant forms of magic in the realm, and the Old Kingdom itself is largely dead. The royal family has been destroyed, and many of the cities and towers have fallen to rubble. It's no coincidence that the book takes place during winter, when the trees are shriveled and lifeless, the animals have gone to hiding, the weather biting and lethal. Now, it's easy for death to lose some of its impact and meaning in a fantasy setting. Fantasy settings usually have fantasy religions, and sometimes go so far as to create their own versions of life after death. Sometimes these fantasy afterlifes are meant to be reflective of real-world ideas of the afterlife, looking at you, Chronicles of Narnia, but Sayriel doesn't opt for any of that. In my opinion, the smartest move this book makes is to not confirm or deny any form of afterlife. What there is instead is a sort of limbo dimension between life and death, a river that runs through nine gates, and every soul must wade the water to the final gate. What lies beyond the final gate, however, is a complete unknown. Souls can be trapped between gates, they can resist the river through force of will. Sometimes souls that haven't died can be imprisoned there. These are the things necromancers manipulate when they do their thing. But they're all just as clueless about the final destination as anyone in our world is. This is a fantastic choice, because it allows Garth Nix to play around with the imagery of death while at the same time keeping every ounce of existential crisis involved in contemplating death. There's a phrase repeated multiple times in the book that goes, does the walker choose the path or the path the walker? It's the closest thing the book has to a catchphrase and has multiple meanings in multiple situations. But in the context of death, it concerns with the inevitable end of our mortal existence. We can talk about free will until we're blue in the face, but every single one of us has a destiny. We're all destined to die. We may have a brief moment on this earth where we can control our trajectory, but that's a fleeting moment sandwiched between stretches of infinite non-existence. The path of death chooses the walker. The villains of this piece are those walkers who attempt to choose their path, who refuse to accept death. However, this bleeds into ideas of destiny, which in turn bleeds into ideas of preordained roles, which bleeds into important bloodlines, which is an idea I'm less enthusiastic about. There are five major bloodlines that exist in the Old Kingdom, and Sabriel and Touchstone each belong to one, and that's what makes them important people. It isn't the quality of their character, it's their genetics that make them the heroes of the story. And this is where we get back to this path of least resistance storytelling, because while the theming of this book is really strong, the actual story and characters feel flat. Every character in Sabriel is the most boring character in Sabriel, because Garth Nix doesn't give a shit about character. How do you go about developing your characters? My characters um, come to me with the story, I guess, in the sense that I know very little about them to start with. I often begin a story and I know little more than the name of the character, and I've really changed the names once I've worked on them. And I do, I spend a lot of time working out the right name. And I put them in a situation, and that's the beginning of the story. And then as I find out the story, I find out more about that character as well. So uh, my characters come out of story as opposed to the story coming out of the characters. But of course, you know, partway through the book, the two infuse each other. You know, I, I'm such a character guy, I put so much value on good characterization that this plot first, characters later method Nyx uses feels so ass backwards to me. It's not uncommon for an author to say that their characters surprise them, that they have no control over them, which is just a fancy way of saying, I came up with a new idea while writing and changed the characters accordingly. And that's perfectly normal. You can change your characters as you go along but have absolutely zero idea as to who your characters are well into writing the story feels wrong. 
It is almost certainly for this reason that Sabriel is kind of a crappy protagonist. Remember how I characterized her earlier, capable but clueless? That might do well in streamlining the story, but it means she is completely incapable as a hero. This is all Sabriel does in this book. She acquires helpful items, and she follows instructions. She doesn't come up with a plan of her own. She doesn't use her wits. She doesn't do anything clever. She just does what she's told, and follows a cookie crumb trail of useful tools. She doesn't even search for them, actually. She's just given them. Your father's messenger's here, and it's brought a Borgian sword and bells, which you need to fight the undead. Hey, there's a bunch of undead in this area, but don't worry, Moggett knows about a button that floods the area. We need to cover a long distance quickly. Thankfully, Abortion has a magical flying machine in his attic. Oh, but you don't know the magic spells required to fly it? Well, you're in luck, because it comes with a magic instructional video you can watch first. By the way, I'm a magical cat that can sometimes lose control and go on torture murder rampages, so here's a magic ring that'll calm me down and it replicates itself, so you basically have an infinite amount of get out of jail free cards. Here, just follow this map. We need to find a body, but actually these girls over here already know where it is and they'll just tell us. And they'll lend us their magical flying machine because it turns out that these were mass produced, which kind of takes away the magic of them, but whatever, it's convenient. If you had a character who's not already comfortable with these magics, you'd have to watch her learn, watch her grow in understanding, you know, a character arc, and there's no time for that. And if you had a character who knew everything there was to know about the Old Kingdom, she might come up with her own ideas, make her own plans, solve these problems herself, rather than have other people give her the solutions. You know, agency. And there's no time for that either. The path of least resistance also means the path of least effort. None of these characters have much in the way of personality. Nobody jokes around. There's no humor to be found in this book at all. Moggett would seem to be cut from the same cloth as other talking cat familiars in fiction, but he lacks the sarcasm and exasperation that makes those other characters so much fun. Touchstone makes things a little more interesting because he insists on using formal titles around Sabriel, which Sabriel doesn't care for, kind of a poor man's Prince Jake situation. And the two do wind up in a very clumsy, unearned romantic relationship. Also, Touchstone's penis is circumcised. I don't know why the book felt compelled to tell us this, but it's more detail than some characters get. Karagor is just a mustache twirling villain. He's given a little backstory that ties to his relationship with Touchstone, but his only given motivation is that he's evil. The only secondary villain is the Mordicant, which acts as a snarling beast that tracks and chases Sabriel across the Old Kingdom. And then it stops. The book seemed to have been setting up a final showdown between Sabriel and the Mordicant, but that never happens, and instead Sabriel fights Karagor, even though Touchstone is the one with a beef with him. Sure, Sabriel is better equipped at fighting the guy than Touchstone, but Touchstone doesn't really have much to do besides being an extra sword hand and giving controlled exposition dumps. I say controlled because this book has a pretty lame way of keeping information away from Sabriel. It seems the land has been cursed, and nobody is allowed to talk about things involving the bloodlines or the history of the Old Kingdom. For what reason? I don't know. The book teases you with the idea that maybe Sabriel has to be clever in getting information. Like, she finds a child's nursery rhyme and tries to piece together the historical context behind it. It's the first time Sabriel feels like a proactive presence in the story. But that idea is soon dashed in the very next chapter, when the characters discover that the curse doesn't work when you're on a boat in the ocean. So Touchstone and Moggit just info dump right then and there. Path of Least Resistance. So that leaves us with a conundrum. How do you value a book that is poorly constructed, but has a very good central theme? Should I, as a reviewer, recommend it because it engages with themes of death and mortality that are really refreshing for its genre? Or should I not recommend it for flat plot and underdeveloped characters? What's really the more valuable aspect of fiction? That's not a question I can easily answer. I suppose here's how I fall. Theming is great, 
But theming is accessed through the text, and if the text isn't engaging, you're never going to get to that creamy nugget center. Of course, many people do think the text is engaging. This is a semi-classic in the field of young adult fantasy, and one of my personal friends considered it his favorite book. And I'm not here to tell someone not to like something. There are strong imaginative ideas here. The use of bells in magic is a neat idea, and the descriptions of the various undead monsters are chilling. The magic mass-produced airplane is adorable, and with that strong theming behind it, I can totally see why a person would want to get lost in this world. But if you don't put care into your characters, if you don't put care into your plot, you're gonna lose me. Take it away from this setting and these themes, put it in a generic Dungeons and Dragons setting, and you'll have nothing but empty calories. I suppose how much you'll enjoy this book depends on how much junk food you can stand.